What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Ransom Reviews. I've got a bunch of book content coming for you. I read, I think, 102 books last year. And so I'm going to have top 10 science fiction, top 10 fantasy, top 10 nonfiction, top 10 worst books I read last year, and top five general fiction, I think, all coming down the pipe. Today's video is top 10 science fiction books that I read in 2021. So let's get started. Now, in 10th place, I did have a tie. A bunch of books had the same score. All of these books have been scored already using my own rating system. So it's very easy for me to go back and see uh, what the ranking is. But let's do a couple of honorable mentions before we get to number 10. So first, Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers by Grant Naylor, which scored an eight. This is an audiobook that I listened to, and it's basically a parody of a parody. It's a parody of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's just uh, a lot of fun to listen to. I definitely laughed throughout this, this reading, and uh, the voice acting is tremendous. Apparently, it is a TV show, a well-known TV show uh, in England, but I was not aware of that until after reading, and I've never seen it. But um, this audiobook is really, really great, really fun, um, nothing too serious, nothing really to chew on, but definitely worth a listen. My next honorable mention is Beggars in Spain by Nancy Kress. And this book has a fantastic premise. So in our near future, uh, gene mods have become very common and a lot of people have access to them to sort of change their future baby's eye color or how tall they're gonna be, this and this and that. Um, basically, you know, I would be making my baby just really tall and with a great vertical so they could play basketball and skateboard and all that stuff. But um, the real game changer is they have found a way to remove the need to sleep. And this has basically created a subclass of humans known as sleepless who don't have to sleep. And because of that become rich, powerful, influential, very productive members of society with all that extra time on their hands. And then unfortunately, the normal people, the sleepers, as they're called, turn on them. So there's a lot of really interesting dynamics politically, sociologically um, going on in this book that goes on with the sleepers versus the sleepless and what sort of happens. Really interesting, uh, not perfect, but like I said, the premise is just really great science fiction. And the last honorable mention is Akira, volume one by Katsuhiro. Tomo, uh, post-apocalyptic Tokyo, teenage motorbike gangs are getting involved in some sort of like government conspiracy that creates uh, a superhuman a superpower. If you're not familiar with Akira at all, it's a very legendary anime movie that I watched when I was younger, but obviously has the graphic novels as well. This is something I'm just now getting into, and they're excellent. Um, I'm not going to say that the story is amazing, or at least it isn't yet. But the artwork is tremendous, especially the the real sense of speed and movement that um, that they're able to convey with these motorbikes racing around the city. Really, really cool stuff. Definitely recommend uh, anyone to check that out. It's good. It's good. It's really good stuff. So let's get started with the actual list. Coming in at number ten, also with a score of eight point zero is Foundation and Empire by Isaac Asimov. Now, I did read, I think, four Foundation books last year, and um, this was my favorite one. None of the other ones made the list. I know that's blasphemous for many science fiction fans, but uh, Asimov is not my favorite writer in the genre, and Foundation I found to be mostly underwhelming. Um, I did enjoy this one, however, Foundation and Empire. It's the book that basically has the mule, introduces the mule, which, in my opinion, is the most interesting aspect of the entire Foundation series. Uh, I don't want to explain too much about who the mule is or what his powers are, because really, if you are planning on reading this book or Foundation at all, sort of discovering... Um, what he is and who he is and how his powers work is, like I said, it was my favorite part of this whole series. So I don't really want to spoil that for you. I would just say that um, 
this to me was the highlight of the series and it was all downhill after this. Coming in at number nine with a score of 8.3 is The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester. In a world which the police have telepathic powers, how do you get away with murder? So that's the tagline for this book. Um, this was just such a fun read. Uh, slick, pulpy, bold, inventive, and frenetic crime thriller. It's definitely got some influence. Like you can definitely tell that this sort of writing style, the ideas that he came up with in this book, some of the inventions that he was tinkering around with, um, influenced uh, Philip K. Dick, who is one of my favorite writers, uh, William Gibson probably as well. It was a bit confusing at times. I wasn't really sure what was happening half the time, but the book just moves so fast that you really don't get hung up on it. It's just really jumpy, quick, fun. Um, I guess you could say uh, hasn't aged well in some respects, like the female characters are pretty ridiculous. Um, the science is laughably bad at time, at times, but man, the book is totally awesome and fun and enjoyable. And I just love Alfred Bester. He's got uh, two books now that rank right up there in the top of anything that I've read in the science fiction genre. So definitely check that one out as well. Uh, moving on to number eight. Also with a score of 8.3, The Moat in God's Eye by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell. So this is probably the best first contact story I've ever read and is definitely the most interesting alien species that has ever been written. I don't really think that's debatable. Then again, it's the only great thing about this book. Um, the human characters are all, I don't even remember who they are, what they were doing. Um, the story itself isn't really that great, but the Modis, as they're called, the alien species, the Modis are the stars here, and they are completely and utterly fascinating. Um, they facilitate really interesting discussions on specialization versus generalization. And again, this is another thing I don't want to spoil, because if you haven't read it, most of the fun of this novel is just sort of coming into contact with them trying to figure out how they work and what their goals are and what's going on with the interactions between um, the Modis themselves and the Modis and the humans. So let me just say that the Modis are completely captivating from the moment they come on the page until the moment the story is over. So if you think that's something you would enjoy learning about a really unique alien species, then definitely check out the moat in God's eye. Moving on to number seven is A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller, also with a score of 8.3. Now, off the top of my head, I can only think of maybe three books in the science fiction genre where structure is kind of like one of the most valuable parts of the book, one of the most interesting aspects of the book. Um, Hyperion is one by Dan Simmons. 2001, A Space Odyssey is another by Arthur C. Clarke. And then there's this, A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller. So this book is separated into three sections with similar beginnings and similar endings. And yet they're set hundreds of years apart. And it follows members of this religious order in a post-apocalyptic society. And they're kind of trying to gather information from the past or protect information from the past. What's really interesting here is, like I said, the structure and the way that the story is laid out is so well done. And it does have some really resonant themes on the cyclical nature of human stupidity, I guess I could call it, church versus state, even euthanasia. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on with the themes and you know typical of that sort of post-apocalyptic subgenre it's a really dark book and grim at times and yet i must have laughed out loud half a dozen times it's surprisingly humorous i mean the humor is dark which is my favorite type but um man miller can really write i was so impressed with his writing so just to give you a couple of samples here of, of how he writes 
Uh, instead of saying it's about to rain, he would write a sky herd of cumulus clouds on their way to bestow moist blessings on the mountains after cruelly deceiving the parched desert began blotting out the sun and trailing dark shadow shapes across the blistered land below. Instead of saying that uh, someone is about to get their donkey stolen, Miller writes, before the inevitable band of robbers relieved him of his ass. <laughs> and then this was probably my favorite one. When searching for a metaphor to describe fear as a natural occurrence, Miller wrote, steel screams when it's forged. It gasps when it's quenched. It creaks when it goes under load. I think even steel is scared, son. So again, just a really impressive structure to this story and the prose as well was really, really well done. Not a perfect story, not always interesting, but um, definitely worthy of being a classic in the genre. So that brings us to number six with a score of 8.5 is Slaughterhouse-Five or the Children's Crusade by Ryan North. Now, Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. in my mind is a classic in any genre. It's one of the most powerful anti-war stories I've ever read. It contains the classic, dark, irreverent, and satirical humor of Kurt Vonnegut. It also has really clever and interesting science fiction themes as evidenced by the legendary line, Billy Pilgrim has become unstuck in time. And I don't really have that much to say about the graphic novel adaptation, which is what this book is. The illustrations work well. They fit the story. Um, the truncated script captures Vonnegut's spirit and style and hits the major plot notes. Uh, of course, the book is better. The book is way better. And honestly, this graphic novel is probably getting a higher score than maybe it deserves because of its connection with the book. You know, it's it's a lovely companion piece to the original novel. And obviously, I'm influenced by the fact that that original novel is one of my favorite books of all time. But uh, yeah, the graphic novel is nice. It's just a pleasant reminder of one of the greatest books I've ever read. Okay, number five is the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 1 by Robert Silverberg. And this got a score of 8.7 overall. The tagline for this book reads, if you own only one anthology of classic science fiction, it should be the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 1, 1929 to 1964. I think I could probably get down with that statement. Um, there's something in this book for everyone. I mean, there's a lot of stories, so you should be able to find something you like. For me, there was a lot of stories in here that I really enjoyed. You know, science fiction short story collections are, they're really hit or miss because, you know, you're going to get a bunch of stories that are good. You're going to get a bunch in the middle, and you're also usually going to get a bunch of duds. And that's just the nature of the beast. However, um, I found that this story, this collection of stories was remarkably consistent for the quality. There were only a couple of duds in here for me. And I think I counted 13 stories that I rated from good to great, including the timeless flowers for Algernon, the brilliantly inventive surface tension, the delightfully clever Mimsy were the Borobor groves and the powerfully resonant microcosmic gods. So there's some real classics in this collection and uh yeah i was just really really impressed because a lot of people look at older science fiction and kind of look at it as sort of like this almost cliche genre now that it hasn't aged well and, um i think some of these stories are absolutely timeless some of them are a bit showing their age and a little bit clunky but um some of them are just absolutely great so i would very very highly recommend if you are a fan of science fiction if you are a fan of short stories, to pick up the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 1 by Robert Silverberg. Number four is also a short story collection, Blood Child by Octavia E. Butler. And that got a score of 8.8. .8. So basically right after stating that the Science Fiction Hall of Fame is the one short story collection 
that you should own. I have two more <laughs> short story collections that ranked above it just from last year. So basically, I am a liar. I've just recently discovered Octavia E. Butler, probably in the last two years, and it's been so cool to explore uh, some of her worlds and some of her writing. This collection is quite short. I think there's five or six or seven stories in here, but it still manages to contain two classics, in my opinion, and also a couple of essays on writing that are really great, especially if you are an aspiring writer. I mean, even for me, I enjoyed them and I'm not gonna flatter myself, call myself an aspiring writer, but I really did enjoy the essays. They, you know, a lot of times these, these sort of collections have those kind of just tacked on and these felt essential and they really added a lot to the collection in my opinion. Uh, the two stories that I really, really like in this collection are the um, titular Blood Child and also The Evening and The Morning and The Night. Those are both uh, really, really great stories in my opinion. So top three. Number three is Her Smoke Rose Up Forever by James Tiptree Jr. And this got a score of 9.3. I don't think there was a book that I read last year that impacted me more than this one. I've simply never read anything like it. So James Tiptree Jr., also known as Alice Sheldon, wrote searing, eviscerating stories full of violence and death and sex and man-hating. <laughs> There's a lot of like serious, heavy-duty man-hating. And yet, I absolutely love it. Um, even the stories that I hated like really affected me in a way that makes them memorable. The collection is just, it's so disturbing. It's so depressing. It's haunting. It can be infuriating at times, but it doesn't uh, let go of you. I think I read these stories over a year ago now or close to a year ago now, because I, I read it at the start of the year in 2021. And uh, I still think about them. I still think about them a lot. And I don't think that I'll ever forget this collection. I don't know why this book isn't, this collection, this author isn't more well known. I do everything that I can to tell people to read this because I just think, um, yeah, I think it's criminally undervalued and underrated in the science fiction genre. This is some of the wildest stuff, uh, some of the most powerful stuff in the genre that I've, that I've read. Number two on the list is Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. And this got a 9.5. Have you been searching for the best naked underage boy fight in all of literature? <laughs> well, it's your lucky day. Um, but all joking aside, I can't imagine anyone not enjoying Ender's Game. It's just so damn good. Um, yeah, sure. Orson Scott Card is a little bit of a creep in real life. And yeah, there are some moments in this book where you're like, do these young boys really need to be naked? But um, that's such a minor gripe. And really, when you look at this book in its entirety, it is close to perfect. And similar to Harry Potter, it seems to be great for all or at least a wide ranges, a wide range of ages. I think you could read this book in your early teenage years. I obviously read it as a you know, much older person and really, really enjoyed it. This is actually my first read of this book. Somehow I missed reading this when I was younger. I think I saw the movie, which was pretty average, to be honest, um, when it came out. And that kind of put me off from reading the book because I just felt like, well, I know this story already. Don't do that. Don't be like me. Read the book. The book is... Um, an absolute classic. It's just so good from beginning to end. It has thoughtful reflections on leadership and military tactics and human communication and has comp it has compelling characters. It has a really excellent twist and uh, it's just packed with action. Uh, there isn't a part 
of this story that sags. It's just tight from beginning to end. And that brings us to number one, the number one book I read in all of science fiction last year, 2021, is Dune by Frank Herbert, which scored a 9.8. Now, this was a reread. I first read this book about 25 years ago, and it really never left my memory. And so I finally decided to reread it to see if it sort of held up to how good I thought it was. And yeah, it absolutely holds up. I can easily see why I haven't forgotten about this book in more than two decades. It's a masterpiece, in my opinion. It, uh, it is just so full of everything. It has religion. It has politics. It has uh, prophecy and prophet. It talks about war. It um, captures an alien planet. Uh, it talks about space travel. It goes into human evolution. It has um, iterations of hand-to-hand -hand combat. It goes into ecology and conservationism. I mean, really, it's just got everything. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's a masterpiece. It's also really interesting because it doesn't have a lot of the typical sci science fiction trappings. You know, there's no... Um, there's not a lot of high technology in here. There is no robots or artificial intelligence. And yet it still has kind of managed to be the, the trendsetter and the high watermark in the genre for so long. And I don't see it being knocked off of, off of that perch anytime soon. Now, I don't think this book is for everyone like Ender's Game. Um, some readers do seem to find it too long, too slow certain parts or find the writing and story telling style to be clunky. Uh, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Obviously, that's not how I feel about it. But yeah, there are some people out there who don't love Dune. And again, one of the things I think that comes into this is your your expectations. I think because Dune is so famous at this point and is so well known, and especially now that these movies are coming out and it's back in in the spotlight people kind of i think people who haven't read this book go into it with this incredibly high uh, expectation and i find from my own reading experience a lot of times when i have those really really high expectations i end up feeling disappointed so what i would say is if you are somebody who thinks thinks you might be interested in reading dune and you haven't seen the movie um just try to keep an open mind. Just go in with an empty, empty expectations and just read it. And see if you like it. For me, it's uh, one of the greatest books um, I've ever read and the best book in the science fiction genre I read last year. So that is my top 10 list. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you made it this far, drop me a comment. Let me know um, what your top 10 science fiction books are, or just even give me an idea of some of the good science fiction books that you read in 2021. And also, if you agree or disagree with any of my particular rankings, don't be afraid. Don't be shy to let me know. I don't mind a good, uh, healthy debate. And other than that, I will see you next time, probably for another top 10 uh, from 2021 on Ransom Reviews.